Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that's caught our eye this week. I'm James, and with me is adventure editor Marcus Crafty Craft. Hello. And news editor Tung Nguyen. Welcome. Good day. Good to be back. <laughs> this week, we're looking at a new direction in ute and SUV evolution that could be about survival of the fittest. And we'll talk about some of this week's entries in the Cars Guide garage, and we'll catch up with the original Energizer Easter Bunny in this week's Must Watch. So stay with us. But first of all, we've got some feedback to, to go through and talk about, which is fantastic. We Last time round, we were looking at Chinese knockoffs. We thought they were a thing of the past, but apparently not. And one of them, uh, the high profile one, of course, is a, um, the Hangtian uh, Land Cruiser uh, wannabe bootleg version. So Peter Painting came in and said, some of those Chinese knockoffs look better than the original, which I thought was quite good. <laughs> um, each yeah, to well, their they own. Get good. They get yeah, good. But, yeah. but Hammer Rocks says, Hammer. You know, he, we asked if people if we'd missed any, and he's come up with another four. And for people watching on YouTube, we'll have a picture of each of these. Well, he would. So uh, the, the, the Toyota RAV4, um, if imitation is the highest form of flattery, uh, had the Zhengjiang Zhongwei UFO, which was pretty much a carbon copy um, of an earlier version uh, RAV4. Mm. Then the BMW X5 was copied really by the Shanghuan CEO, S C E O, so I'm calling it CEO. Mm. Um, the Lexus RX had its own fan club with the Hanghai NCV, <laughs> and the <laughs> Audi A4 Avant was kind of rebooted as the Yemma F-16, which sounds like a fighter plane, but oh. it actually looks a lot like an Audi wagon. Oh, um, yeah. So with those pronunciations, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Hammer. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Michael Lee, who was a correspondent last time round, um, said he used to work for Hyundai in China, and he's come back with a little more info and says, really, it's just like building a car out of Lego. You can go to a manufacturer and say, look, we want a complete powertrain and then another one and we want a suspension and they'll do that for you. And mm. then you get some engineering graduates and put it all together and wrap a body around it and get other suppliers for that. And so long right. as it meets regulations, you just start selling it. Mm. And it's actually fine-tuned by region. Some of the smaller cities, um, he said his, his former employer was Hyundai. And he said it varies by region. Like some regions have different regulations around emissions or safety or whatever it might be. So they're built absolutely to spec for different regions of the country. So it's just a really uh, complicated kind of patchwork quilt of different cars being built for different parts of China, yeah. which uh, sounds kind of amazing. He said, just sharing what I know, love the discussions, top job with a oh, smiley face. Oh, so nice. nice. Thank oh, you very even, much, Michael. Even through an emoji. Nice. <laughs> it's I still it. don't get... understand what they are, but yeah, good on <laughs> We get our fair share of emojis, I must say. Um, I just want to. I just want to dive in quickly. The the danger yeah. is that uh, a lot of people laugh these things off and write them yeah. off, but they're getting better all the time. And I think uh, you know, they, these are these are the future's genuine contenders for uh, you know yeah. good budget, solid, you know, nice to drive uh, SUVs and Utes. Well, witness uh, the rise of MG in the Australian market. Um, yeah. Think about um, LDV, Great Wall, um, yeah. on it goes. So the long forecast, you know, onslaught of Chinese brands into this market seems to be seems to be coming to pass. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Stendek Stretcher says, <laughs> "I had a Land, I had a Land Cruiser two hundred, didn't like the handling, looking at a new shape Patrol." To which Peter Painting chimed in again and said, years ago, looked at buying a 200 series, hit my head on the door frame whenever I attempted to get in the driver's <laughs> seat, kept the Pajero instead. <laughs> which is fair enough. Look, if you can't get in without hitting your head, he must he be must, a, a, he must a taller be a tall person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tall yeah. Now, Wax333, who of course is our New Zealand correspondent, said, as far as I knew, all the Great Wall vehicles have used Mitsubishi running gear. Mm. I wonder if the Eclipse Cross 1.5 litre turbo engine is the same as in the Haval H2 or that Land Wind. Um, is the 2 litre turbo engine that's in the H9 based on the Mitsubishi 4G63? Tuning potential. Okay, so he's thinking kind of um, mm. 
mm. Lance Arrivo style tuning up your, your um, new age Chinese entrance. Um, Millen Rogers then responded by saying that he didn't think Mitsubishi still makes that engine, the NG63. But even if they did, they probably wouldn't use it in a ute. It's more of a performance engine than a workhorse. Saying that if Mitsubishi were still making the G4 uh, G63, how good would it be in a Triton? <laughs> so um, <laughs> I enough. reckon that's, that's pretty good too. Uh, it would be interesting. When you think about Raptor and, and uh, Entrep yeah. Warriors and Onyx. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, Neza, on a similar vein, says, talking of small, powerful turbo engines, imagine if Mercedes-Benz chucked in their A45 unit into the base X class. Um, wow. Mm -hmm. Sure, the torque would come in later, but would, be, would have been a hoot. And I yeah. agree. It yeah, would have wolf, been. It? Yeah. But so many people wanted an AMG version of that thing when it, when it first arrived, and they were resol resolutely against that idea. Yeah, yep. Uh, but that seems like an interesting one. Um, Christian Abraham says, why can't manufacturers go with generator electric? Way more efficient. Now, I think generator electric means, does that mean like a, a hybrid, but you're, you're, you've got an engine, it's like GM Volt style? Um, yeah, like a, like a range extender? Correct. Yeah. It's a range extender, Electrical. but where, yeah, the, 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 the engine never touches the wheels, as it were. Yes. Um, I think we're there. We've done that. Yeah. Um, way yeah. more efficient. There are yeah. any number of examples of that. But anyway, Christian, if we've got it wrong, just let us know and we'll just clarify what, what you want us to uh, have a look at there and we will try to oblige. Mm. Now, MR says he sounds, it sounds like a V8 aspirated diesel is required and then he signs off from the asshole of the world. <laughs> that's, that, Tung, that's possibly Has a Jerry he? Seinfeld Melbourne yeah. reference. I remember when Jerry Seinfeld uh, described Melbourne that way when he was looking at the globe. Like if you mm -hmm. turn it this way, that's where <laughs> Melbourne is. Um, so maybe MR is in Melbourne. Now, also, let's see if, says, I approve of that bald guy's sign saying 350 great Victorians. Uh, good, to see, good to see Vic's recognised for once. And Ian Thomas says, from my angle, it says victories, but 350 great Victorians is way better. I'm with you, bro. Two thumbs up emojis. Um, now, David Burt then said 350 of Michelin's best tyres. I've got to explain this poster behind me. I'll move my head, it says 350 Grand Prix victories, and that's for Goodyear. So that went from Richie Ginther in 1965 with the Mexico Grand Prix, and that was a 1.5-litre V12 car. It was Honda's first ever victory, and it stood for a heck of a long time. Um, and then finishes with David Coulthard in 1997 winning the Australian Grand Prix wow. in a McLaren MP410, uh, MP412. Mm. And that was a three-litre V10. So that's what the poster was. It was in Autosport magazine forever ago. Oh, but cool. uh, there yeah, you go. Yeah. Now, our new best friend from Bolivia, Jorge Luis Bojoa Cosio, oh, um, has, oh, has, has come, up at, come at us again. He says he hopes to soon be in the market for a 4x4. Since he sold his 01 Pajero, I've been craving for a Wrangler JK two-door manual. He wants the topless experience. I live in the warmer side of Bolivia next to Brazil. Um, my other option is to sell the Civic Coupe, so he's got a Civic Coupe, buy a cheaper Miata to get the convertible ride, plus that cash, and get a 2011 to 2012 Toyota Tundra. Wow. He's, he's all over the shop. He's, he's, like, he's, he's like the Jay Leno of Bolivia. <laughs> his garage he's is chopping. Trying to build a garage, garage yeah. Yes. <laughs> now... NDI Prez, Ken Preston, says, hi, do City's golf car, please. So that one's left me a bit perplexed. I'm not okay. sure whether he's asking or she is asking us to look at a golf cart mm. or a particular variant of the VW of Golf, the golf. Yeah. or City cars in general. So maybe we could get some clarity on that as well and we'll do our best. And finally, David Burt says, yes, the vehicle world post-corona will be different. I guess the question is, how different? Will the vehicle purchase experience be different? More home demos and online purchasing, downsizing, less of an emphasis on cup holders, although we will always have a strong emphasis <laughs> on cup holders at Cars Guide. Um, could the Chrysler Centura return? Um, what's the Cars Guide crystal ball, acronym CGCB, telling you? So the Centura coming back would be amazing, you know, for... 
for those that may not be familiar with that car, a beautiful locally developed and uh, designed product with an inline six cylinder engine in a compact size rear wheel drive. I think it was a mm. more or less a Tirana competitor. I, I can't see it coming back, David, but uh, it would be interesting. Mainly because Chrysler, they're not into that kind of product in Australia anymore. In this crazy mixed up world, who knows? Who knows? But um, I think inevitably with a situation like this, for what it's worth, where people are forced to adopt a different way of living and working, those that that can um, still continue to work from home or in other ways, it does have an effect because you realise maybe I didn't need to do things that way. It just forces you to adopt a different approach. And you may, in fact, realise it's easier, more efficient, more cost-effective, whatever it is. So if dealers are adapting and car companies are adapting to this situation, I'm sure there will be some changes that come out of it. Yeah, for sure. What's interesting is, uh, you know, people rely so heavily on public transport now. And I think after this post-coronavirus world, are people going to, you know, uh, look to buy their own car so they can commute away from everyone else? Yeah, Yeah, maybe. I mean, uh, sadly, for taxis and ride-sharing companies, there's a bit of a stigma around that now, and it's made people more aware of transmission of viruses and and germs in general, and uh, apparently uh, colds and flu typically coming in at this time of year. Um, There's a big reduction in terms of people with colds Mm. or flu because everybody's being more cognizant of, of personal hygiene and washing their hands and all that basic stuff. Yeah, I think I think Tung's spot on. I think as but as well as conventional car sales, I think coming out of the end of all of this, everyone's going to be planning so many trips away because you're going to have had such a gut full of the people that you live with. Yes, <laughs> yes. that you want to. So I think four wheel drives, SUVs, soft roaders, you know, yeah. two wheel drive sort of things with with a vague sort of leaning towards going on a gravel trip. I think these things are going to go. Go absolutely, you know they're gonna they're gonna sell uh, like hotcakes because people are gonna want to get away. They're gonna yeah. want to travel by themselves rather than go on public transport. And I think yeah. the whole world's gonna change. But I think you know we've proven pretty adaptable uh, so far um, mm. during mm. this whole thing. And I think uh, that's just gonna things are gonna change a little bit, but for the better. Perhaps. And the the bit about um, having had a gut full of the people that you're living with, Craft, are you projecting there? Is that something that uh, people in your house have been complaining about? Oh no, not at all, not at all. Uh, my 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 family are uh, yeah we're we're a tight unit. They're not oh, they're right very now, good. So I very can uh, yeah, so I can <laughs> I can have a go at them because they've gone for a walk. But uh, oh, very good, yeah. very good. <laughs> All right. Now, we were, we were touching at various points there on uh, utes and what might power them and how they might be configured. Um, our main topic of conversation today is around a story that our own David Morley wrote because he had the opportunity to speak to a, a particular person within Ford Motor Company. And he's saying that utes, they're big in Australia already, that, that's for sure, and other countries as well. Uh, but the standby for them to take over from SUVs as a preferred means of transport for families and that what we could be seeing is a blurring of the lines between dual cab utes and SUVs. Um, do you need a dual cab ute that's able to tow three and a half tonnes? Therefore, it's set up with a certain suspension, which means that it rides and handles in a certain way, or maybe you don't, you know. Crafty, you, you as adventure editor, I suppose you're crossing over into an area that doesn't really exist yet, but um, it's an interesting one. I think, um, yeah, and I think we're, we're, we're probably almost there already. I think people are using their dual cab utes as a wagon almost. I mean, perhaps they want a wagon, but they, they, they like the look and the driving experience of a dual cab and the versatility. And our aftermarket industry in Australia is so, so awesome, so busy, the products are high quality. People will buy a dual cab ute and throw a canopy straight on the back. So if yes. you want a covered storage area, you've got a covered storage area. I mean, yeah. you can put a canopy on it or there's tonneau covers, all those sort of things. So if you're worried about the, you know, not having the security of a covered uh, cargo area as you would in a wagon, you can easily sort that out in a dual cab. I, and I think, you know, in terms of car-like ride and handling, I mean, we're pretty much close to those sort of uh, aspects already in things like the Ranger 
and, 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 you know, dual cabs of that ilk. Um, and everything else is improving all the time, I think. Um, and for, again, you know, versatility as a family daily driver, as a work uh, tool and as a weekend sort of trip away vehicle, those things tick all the boxes. Yes. And I, I think you've got the other aspect being safety, that the, the yes. high ride height and the platform on which a lot of the dual cab utes sit means that they are very rigid. They're strong, but very rigid. So they struggle a little more in terms of getting that all important five star and cap rating. So a change along those lines would be one for the better, I'd imagine. Yeah, well, I think, and that's, and that's you know, with regards to everything. I mean, safety is, is paramount with everything. So if they're going to improve, if, if the look's going to change a little bit and the structure's going to change a little bit and they're going to be, uh, you know, somehow, you know, sort of people's idea of them will, you know, will that they'll be a little bit softer um, I think, you know, that's, that's nonsense, uh, you know, ultimately. Uh, yeah. And those are always things you can address further down the line, um, you know, with, you know, in, in terms of the warranty and whatever, obviously you'd have to be a bit more mindful of, of, of how those changes to suspension and those sort of things affect yeah. uh, your warranty and, and that sort of stuff. But, you know, they are versatile, they are safe, um, and uh, in terms of a family vehicle uh, and in terms of replacing our idea of a wagon and those sort of things as the ultimate family vehicle, then they're pretty much close to there already. So mm -hmm. it, just, it just makes sense to me, doesn't it? You know, uh, you have how many, how many uh, Ford Ranger owners out there actually, are actually tradies? How many of them actually go yeah. on the weekend? Yeah. Yeah. And how many of them are buying, you know, wild tracks or Ranger Raptors uh, because they like the look of it or yeah. Yeah, they like to throw the surfboard in the back. So yeah. building uh, a ute vehicle on uh, an SUV platform, uh, which reports have surfaced already, you know, Ford yeah. are exploring um, building a smaller ute on the same platform they build their new generation Escape on. Um, how many... You know, how many more people would that appeal to? Uh, mm. A lifestyle ute like that, that has the safety, that, that rides and handles like an SUV. Um, you know, it, it makes sense. I would buy yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, it, yeah. It's, um, I mean, David in his story makes reference to the Hyundai Santa Cruz, which is, which is going to be just that for the American market. Um, and the person that he spoke to, I should mention, is a guy called Jeremy Welch. And he's Ford's Emerging Markets Strategic Project Manager. So he's been looking at these things and the emerging market, it feels like he's creating them more than identifying them. Um, and he said in Germany, for example, um, there are some tax concessions, but people are opting for dual cab utes for lifestyle purposes. They might just like bike riding. And if I don't, I don't know about you guys, but when you've ever been near a mountain in Germany or Austria or Switzerland in summertime, there's just mountain bikes everywhere. Back, um, yeah, yeah. And, and these are the right height for loading in your bike. There are some yeah. tricky accessories yeah. where you can just put your bikes in the back and they're very popular for that kind of reason. So you don't need the massive load capacity. You don't need the huge towing capacity. So um, there are numerous kind of situations where it would be ideal. No, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, all right. Now, what we're going to do is move on. And look, before we do, Love to get people's feedback in terms of where they sit with that. It might be current dual cab ute owners, it might be current SUV owners. What would you want to see in a vehicle that blends those two ideas together? We'll probably end up with a Holden Crewman. You know, it'll be a uh, it'll be the dual cab ute of old. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. let us let us know what uh, what you think. But we'll now move to our garage and what's been residing within it. And Crafty, I'll kick off with you. We were just on Utes, and you've been in one, but doing interesting things with it. Yeah, well, funnily enough, uh, I, I spend a fair bit of my time in Utes, <laughs> as, I mean, as well as my own thing. Um, yeah. But uh, I was in a Ford Ranger XL, uh, a 2.2 litre, um, and my first time in, in one of those uh, with the 2.2. Mm. Uh, I've obviously been in the, the 3.2 and the, and the, the 2 litre. Um, versions of those things, but um, it's 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 quite an entry level offering. Um, steel wheel, sixteen inch steelies, cloth seats, yeah. So mm -hmm. 
cloth mm-hmm. sheets, um, vinyl floor, you know, all that sort of stuff. I mean, people always throw around the the phrase you can hose out the the floor, but um, hose out the inside, <laughs> and you yes. know, I. I I'd they're more directing. Stuff. They're more directing that at you, crafty. Like yeah, you can yeah. you can hose out the interior now, please. <laughs> as you've oh, been driving the truck, sprayed out with pesticide because it generally <laughs> stinks. You know, when <laughs> yes. yeah, but uh, but I I had a great time. And the thing, the the reason why we got that uh, was uh, we'd set up a load test. So we went to our friends in uh, in 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 Bombardary, uh, agricultural stock and feed uh, place. Lovely people. Um, we loaded up. Uh, it was almost 800 kilograms in the tray. Its payload is about 1230, so 1230 kilograms. Um, so with me, you know, I'm only 55 kilograms, size of a jockey. <laughs> ring, <laughs> ringing, ringing wet. <laughs> That's right. No, but with uh, so with me and a little bit of gear in the cab, we were nearing. It was probably almost uh, 900 and something. So we were. We weren't tickling the the payload capacity, but that's certainly a decent load in the back. I mean, we loaded it to the brim uh, in all directions. Mm. Um, And uh, it's a Ranger, so it's nice to drive unladen. I mean, it's a you. People always, you know, you always read or or watch a review, and we always, uh, you know, we journos always whinge about, oh, it's got a skippy rear end. And that's, you know, that's a ute. That's a characteristic they've they've had since the dawn of time. Mm. The things are made to carry a load, so obviously they ride better with the load. This one, um, it did, but the but the ride without a load was was just as nice. I mean, and the steering's always nice and and light and sort of precise. In a Ranger, oh, I always like the feel of it. They don't feel like big units to steer around. Um, mm. uh, just by memory, I think it's about twelve uh, twelve point seven meters. The turning circle. Um, so lovely to drive, um, ride and handling, all very nice. Uh, mm. It's pretty noisy inside because obviously being an entry-level thing, you know, they, they haven't thrown much in the way of uh, sort of noise insulation or whatever. So you get a fair bit of engine noise through the cab. Um, but, uh, yeah, I had a great time. Rides really well with that load. Um, and, uh, and yeah, really really nice. I mean, a little while back, a couple of weeks ago, I was in a D-Max, entry-level D-Max, I think, in SX. Um, I really enjoy the things. They've got a real sort Good. of rough, straight down the line charm. Um, you know, as, they, as, oh, as soon as you said steel wheels, I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too. I mean, it's so nice to see something when you first turn up to, to dive in the thing. It's nice to see steelies on something. And and crafty, the two liter turbo diesel is the same engine as in the Raptor, or, or this, is this is this is a two point two. To oh. let it do. yeah so okay. um and and no worries about whether it's it's grunty enough uh it is noisy when you give it the boot but yep. it can you know it does the work um all right with the with that 800 kilograms uh in the back uh yeah you barely feel it um fantastic yeah so really cool. nice um all right. it's, yeah and it's nice to actually use a ute for what it's intended to essentially, you know, those sort of things, the entry level. Oh, sorry, and it was a four by uh, four by two, so it was a four by two. Okay, okay that's interesting. Yeah. And we'll have a video to accompany your words um, coming up in the in the future at some stage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, absolutely. that's good. That's yeah. good. Brilliant. Okay. Now, Tung, we'll move on to your good self. Yeah. And you've been an entirely different kind of vehicle. Tell us what yeah. you have been steering. Uh, I've been driving a Toyota Corolla sedan hybrid for the last yep. week. Uh, yep. And to be honest with you, you know, with all the lockdown and everything going on, I haven't had as much time behind the wheel as I wanted. Just the occasional trip down to the supermarket or dropping groceries off for my mum uh, who lives by herself. So okay. uh, I was actually blown away at uh, the fuel economy that you can get out of that thing. I was averaging uh, four litres per hundred kilometres. Um, yep. and, and, and while it was sitting still outside your house, the fuel economy was amazing. <laughs> That's basically zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what strikes me the most about that car is that it is it uses the same powertrain as a Toyota Prius, um, but it is also uh, cheaper. It is also a little bit more practical. Uh, so why do both of those cars exist side by side? Mm. Yeah. And uh, Tung, tell me, is that the same generation Prius or is it the powertrain from a generation ago or something like that? It's exactly same, the same as the same current generation one. generation Prius, yep. 
exactly the same. You know, you yeah, right. Questions you get, uh, you know, they're both sedans, so you get four doors. Um, yeah. You, know, you get uh, the the tech is is quite similar, the interior mm -hmm. tech. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it just it. it I think it, it's one of those things, isn't it, where Prius has pretty much served its purpose. You know, it, exactly. it was the one yep. to break the ice. Um, yep. And now the hybrid thing has been rolled out into the mainstream models, and Prius okay. will be waved a fond goodbye, I presume. Yeah. Yes. You know, we already know that Prius C is uh, being discontinued to make room yep. for new generation Yaris, uh, which will yep. also be made uh, with a hybrid. Um, mm -hmm. Prius V exists at the moment simply because it has such a unique selling point of a of a hybrid seven seater. Yeah. You know. Uh, so I, you know, I would wager that you know, Prius might not be around for much longer. Well, I think I think Toyota has, maybe still has, I'm not sure, visions of the Mirai, the yes. hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicle, being the next Prius, as it were, yes. to, to yes. try and get out there, be a bit uh, left of field and get people used to a new technology. For sure. And I was just out at Toyota uh, yesterday picking, uh, dropping that car off, the Corolla, and they're, they're, they're putting, it looks like they're putting huge work into building up a hydrogen refueling station there you go. in Melbourne. Yeah. So, there you know, you we'll probably see more of those Mirais around uh, in the future. Okay. All right. Now, I will chip in finally with the car that I've been oh, driving, yeah. which is, oh, or will we just skip? We'll just skip it. <laughs> I'll, I'll make it as painless as possible. <laughs> um a Genesis G70, and it's the two-liter T Sport, so four-cylinder car, turbo. Um, to put it in context, it's sixty-three thousand three hundred Australian dollars before you put it on road. So, it's not small beer, but it's not stupendous uh, mm. money either. Um, so, it's got plenty of power. It's got plenty of torque, and maximum torque is at fourteen hundred RPM. So. You know, around town, you've got that nice really smell. nice pickup in the mid-range. It's so very easy to drive. Eight-speed auto, so you've got a ratio for <laughs> every purpose. Um, so it's it's constantly in that sweet spot. It's really, really very nice in that regard. And it has the manual shifts, and they're quite sharp. You know, it's, an, it's a conventional auto, but um, pretty, pretty sharp manual shifts. It's about 4.7 metres long, so it's a decent size, but it's not huge. Mm. And it only weighs 1,600 kg, so... Uh, for a car of that size, it's relatively um, – well, it's not a heavyweight, put it that way. So yeah. just I really think they've done a great job with this car. Mm -hmm. the, the biggest uh, problem they're going to have is the establishment of the Genesis brand as, as having credibility in that kind of premium slash luxury part of the market. Mm -hmm. um, the interior looks very nicely finished. It's contemporary but kind of conservative. Um, I think yeah. they've just gone small steps towards where they want to go. Um, nice finish, USBs everywhere, very thoughtful kind of design. Mm. Um, on the downside, the rear headroom was tight for me and the tow room under the seats, I, I found it difficult. If I sat up normally, my head made solid contact with the with the headliner. The lane keeping assist was quite aggressive. So you're driving like, oh, like it's just <laughs> kind of wrenches the wheel out yeah, of your yeah, hand. Yeah. I found yeah. that pretty aggressive. And the media screen, I was talking about the design, it's not integrated into the dash, it just sits up proud, which to me, says you, you could do a bit better than that. You know, there are a lot of people integrating media screens very nicely into the, the dash. It just sits up there. Um, and, that, that you know, I'm, I'm nitpicking, but um, I think overall it was a really enjoyable drive. Yeah, yeah. Five-year warranty certainly helps, doesn't it? Doesn't it, just. So, yeah. um, you know, it was, it's a really good package. And the bigger question is, you know, how accepting people will be mm -hmm. um, of the Genesis brand and what you have to do to prize them off whatever brand they currently favour to consider that car. So it's a big job and it'll take deep pockets to do it. But, yeah. um, you know, Hyundai has those deep pockets and we'll see where Genesis goes. But on the evidence of that product, I thought it was really good. Yeah, it's but it depends on more, of a Lexus, more on Lexus's side than Infinity's side. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Ouch. Well, yes. we'll talk about, you know, talk about deep pockets. I was talking to Tom, um, our colleague Tom, uh, white about that yesterday, and, and I'm old enough. Pockets, yeah. He's got he's got huge pockets. His pants are enormous. <laughs> the the um, I'm old enough to have been around when Lexus launched into Australia, and Toyota was determined. You could just tell. Look, we we may have to take a bit of a knock here. It'll take a while for the uptake to come. Um, 
And Infinity, when it launched in Australia first time around, just wanted to ride on the wake of, of Lexus. You'll do all the hard yeah. yards and yeah. spend all the marketing dollars and establish a Japanese luxury brand and we'll come in on the back of it. And they failed miserably. And sadly, Infinity hasn't gone well second time around because it takes a huge investment. Yeah. You've really got to put your brand out there and market it hard um, and in the right way. But I, I just get the feeling that Hyundai, you can't see them throwing in the towel. Um, Genesis will be around for some time, and, and this is a real good car. No doubt. And they've got some interesting things on the horizon as well that will, will keep the momentum going for them. Yep. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. GV80's large sedan to take on you know, a BMW X5 oh. uh, and potentially more that we're yet yeah. to see. Yeah, yeah, and some beautiful designs, you know, really lovely-looking uh, machines, which counts for a lot because so much in that market is about emotion as it is about, you know, practicality. So. Totally. Yeah, looking forward to seeing where that goes. And in, 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 in terms of looking forward to seeing where something goes, it's time for Musk Watch. Musk Watch. <laughs> okay, now let's kick it Musk off. Watch. This is a, This is a subject we visited before. Um, we're ventilators. Now, sadly, ventilators is something that everyone's become aware of uh, because people are falling ill uh, around the globe. And if you're at the, you know, the di dire stages of a coronavirus episode, you may need to have a ventilator attached so that you can, you know, stay alive. They're, mm -hmm. they're such precious commodities. And early on in the piece, Elon Moss came out and said, yep, so uh, I should sheet this home to the Sacramento Bee, which I wasn't aware of as a publication or site, but it's in uh, California, obviously. And they've got a headline saying, Elon Musk's ventilator, quote, fiasco shows need for more oversight on Gavin Newsom's mask deal. Now, Gavin Newsom is the governor of California. So on March the 23rd, he made a, dra a dramatic announcement that Tesla founder Elon Musk was donating over 1,000 ventilators to California. Now, the question here, and this story raises the question, you know, miraculous news, but was it true um, in the sense that um, Newsom's office now says Musk was supposed to deliver the ventilators directly to hospitals. So far, however, the governor's office says no California hospital has received them. Now, what we're getting into here is semantics, because what has Tesla has donated to hospitals are, uh, it's, is it a ventilator? It's called this, you know, BPAP machine, which is used to help uh, people with sleep apnea when, when they can't sleep and they're waking up constantly during the night. Um, so are they a ventilator? Technically, no. They cost about 800 bucks. The kind of ventilator that will save people from coronavirus, that's about $50,000. Mm. So um, Musk would say, here are these ventilators, and he's even overnight on Twitter put out a list that says, here, here are the hospitals I've sent them to. People are saying, no, they're not really ventilators. <laughs> there are the, they're these other machines. What, yeah. what, what you set the expectation for was ventilators. Um, so what the Sacramento Bee is saying, the governor of the state has gone out with this massive statement saying, all hail Elon Musk, he's giving us a 1,000 <sighs> ventilators for the state, <laughs> and he's got that PR, oh, and now no. yeah. what he's actually coughing up with is not what people thought was going to be forthcoming. Yeah. So Twitter... Um, he's overnight, he said, here's a partial list of hospitals to which Tesla sent ventilators. They were based on direct requests from their ICU wards with exact specifications of each unit provided before shipment. So that sounds pretty compelling that he's, he's more or less fulfilled what he was asked for. But Gustavo Litovsky responded by saying, wrong, the ICU wards needed ventilators. You told them hey, these are the machines we have, not ventilators. Will they work? My guess is they accepted them. You did not give them ventilators. And uh, Kuzo wow. says, I hope this isn't another Thailand cave situation. Oh, which is, you know, we don't oh, want to go there again. Geez, but yeah. I thought another good one was Mar Marcus, Marc Marcus Maximus, oh, which is your right. alternate yeah. name, really. That's <laughs> right. Marcus Maximus says, really strange that so many hospitals and doctors are taking time to thank him for machines that are, quote, useless. So that's true. You know, these yeah. hospitals are grateful for what they're receiving. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just another kind of PR bun fight by uh, a big, yeah. bold statement and then backfilling to, to kind of supply what may have been yeah. promised. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, he's not the king of uh, over-promising and under-delivering. <laughs> and that's that's Silicon Silicon Valley, isn't it? Make the yeah. big, bold statement and then work mm-hmm. like crazy to try and deliver on it. Afterwards, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Now, another post on Twitter was he said, Happy Easter, follow the white rabbit. And I followed that thread and one person posted up a meme, which I thought was really good, and people on YouTube would be able to see it. It's the Easter bunny on the couch and Sigmund Freud next to the bunny in the chair. And the Easter bunny's saying, I don't know where the eggs come from and I don't know why I hide them. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was pretty good. That is and pretty good. And yeah. then there's another one where he's posted, Elon's posted up um, a dog that's been caught by the flash of a camera and its eyes just have these green kind of lines coming out of it. So it looks otherworldly and it has a katana style sword in its mouth. What? Um, it's a Labrador. It's got these blazing green eyes. Mm. Um, so a mix of responses to that, referencing, yes, Wesley Snipes um, in Blade. But what? also there's a there's a famous Reddit meme where a person was talking about uh, while others party, he study the blade. So that's that's <laughs> where the dog is holding this katana. Yeah. But it's also these legendary dogs in Pokemon. Okay, one's called Zacian. And the other is called Zamazenta, right? So this is where this <laughs> connection with this dog with a sword in its mouth has come from. And then someone posted up a picture. Again, those on YouTube can see it. A corgi cross with a, cor- a cardboard sword in its mouth. And yeah. another dog below it, a black bitzer with its head through a fly screen door, which is oh, mimicking nice. these two Pokemon dogs. So I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, Pokemon the share price. The share the share price is a big story because it is sitting at $745.21 for a Tesla share and it was $548 to a, a week ago. So that's the nature of such a volatile stock market, but also Tesla just going up and down like a roller coaster. But Reuters reckons part of the reason for that is that Tesla's China registrations jumped 450% in March because they started their factory up again. Mm. So they went from 2,000 units in February to uh, close to 13,000, <clears> pardon me, in March, in a market that fell 43% in March. The Chinese car market came off 43%, so they've completely bucked the trend, and that's why some people are thinking, all right, time to buy, but you wouldn't be surprised if next week it's down another couple of hundred bucks. It's just that's the way it is at the moment. Yeah, yep. All right, now with that... I think we've reached the finish line. And I want to say no thank you, Tom. No worries. It's a and thank you, Crafty. No, no, thank you. <laughs> and thanks to our production warrior in chief, Mr. Pritchard, for his remote control recording and assembly know how. Today is in his serial killer t shirt. Now, that's, that's Coco the monkey with a knife. And yeah, 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 yeah. his king of diamonds golf pants. Yep. And VB, for people overseas, that's Victoria Bitter Beer High mm. Tops. He's got the VB High Tops on. Yeah. It's a yeah, dazzling, a dazzling combination. We were talking <laughs> earlier. Right? He's got he the Victor Bravos, yep. Oh, mate. Yep. Please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an iTunes listener, please rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, two car radio aerials meet, fall in love, and get married. The ceremony was rubbish, but the reception was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good one. That is a good one. That is a good one. Thank you, chaps. All right. Peace out. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. All right. <laughs>